I'm excited about Bitcoin's more narrow case is digital gold. I think it has a great place in the world. But I don't think that you want to achieve that place in the world by tearing other things down. All right, Peter, uh, it's so nice to be here. How's, uh, how's London treating you today? London's really beautiful at this time of year. You know, London's got a short window every year where it's kind of got the, the best weather in the world. Um, and we're in that window, so we're enjoying it and making the most of it. All right, before we jump in, real quick shout out to the advertisers, Luca and Exodus. Stay tuned, you'll hear more about them later in the show. All right, we're gonna jump into all this fun stuff today. I gotta hear the story. What's, uh, what's going on with the red hair? I really like it. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think I started dyeing my hair like three or four years ago. Um, and you know, it's been, it's had red streaks, blue streaks, uh, pink streaks and really I think it's just a reminder to like not take uh, life too seriously um, and it's also kind of a great filtering mechanism you know when people treat you really differently because you have dyed hair uh, it kind of gives you a great sort of like sense of you know who you're dealing with in the sense that like you know if they care too much about that that's you know not, not a wonderful signal right mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in the COVID era, I actually didn't have my hair dyed because, you know, to get your hair dyed, you have to kind of go into the, you know, the hairstylist and, and get your hair dyed. And, and that was off the table. So for about a year, I had a very normal haircut and uh, London is starting to reopen. And so I can get back to the uh, back to the crazy hair. Nice. I like it. I like it. Um, Coleman. All right. The other uh, kind of fun story thing I got to ask you about is I searched your name on YouTube. I was trying to do a little prep and research for the for the podcast, and a video with Richard Branson came up um, from, from 2016, and it was, a, it was a fun panel where you were kind of going back and forth primarily with this one woman, kind of disagreeing and agreeing on entrepreneurship and innovation. What's the story with uh, with Richard Branson? How do you know him? Yeah, so uh, Sir Richard's family office invested in our Series A way back in 2014. Uh, and so they're one of our earliest investors and we've done, you know, various stuff with the Virgin brand as well as with him personally over the years. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of me on a panel, you know, I think a lot of panels, there's too much agreement. Um, and so I'm kind of always up there trying to keep it a little spicy. He's been into crypto since at least 2014, if not earlier. Um, but I think, you know, they generally have kind of put on long-term bets, both in you know, individual protocols as well as in companies like ours uh, and kind of, you know, just let them, you know, let them sit. They're, they're a hodl. They're running the hodl play, as nice. they say these days. Yeah, the best uh, play. They're not, you know, they're not super active, but they're, they are, a, they are an active hodler. Nice, nice, nice. All right. One, one, uh, one other thing I got to ask before we jump in is, uh, actually, I got two more fun little things. Rumor has it that you and uh, a lot of other blockchain.com folks got your start on a farm. Is this, uh, is this a valid story? Yes. Uh, we asked this question, all new employees, um, you know, where'd you come from? What are you here to do? Blah, blah. But we also say, how did you make your first dollar, euro, pound, you know, whatever your local currency is? And the most common answer is something related to farming. And I don't mean farming in the DeFi sense of the word, but actually like growing shit that people eat. Um, and so I grew up, yeah, on a small farm. Uh, my first dollar that I made was uh, a vegetable garden. I, I leased some land from my parents uh, and had a two acre vegetable garden and I would sell the produce from that at church. From vegetable farming to DeFi yield farming? Is it, uh, I mean, it's just in the roots, huh? Yeah, just going back to my roots, you know, <laughs> back to the farming. Nice. It's a farmer now. Nice. Um, all right, one last thing I got to ask, which I was curious about is how'd you guys get the domain name blockchain.com? Well, you know, we started really, really early, uh, 2011, and no one had really used the term blockchain. It was actually in the Satoshi white paper, block, space, chain. We're, and you know, kind of went through there looking for names, and the first ex product was a, a block explorer where you could look at Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin data. So it's just information about the, the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, so it's just blockchain.info. And, you know, we bought the dot-com domain shortly after that. People always, you know, think it was millions of dollars or something. It was not. It was very inexpensive for both of them. And uh, that's how we got the name. That's how we got the brand. It's just we were really early. Nice. 
Very cool. Um, it's nuts. I was reading your guys's the big fundraise announcement, and there's this one quote. It was like, you know, in late 2014, there were only a handful of venture backed crypto companies. Bitcoin was worth only a couple hundred bucks. We had, I don't know, a million or two million wallets. Six years later, you have 31 million verified users. Bitcoin's at 40K. When you did the raises at 50K, you know, user growth is like five to 10X, it seems like. 25, I think, 25 to 30% of all Bitcoin transactions since 2020, 2012 have occurred via blockchain.com. I mean, how do you feel? You guys just coming off a big multi hundred million dollar raise. You know, the thing that I'm most proud of is probably that 28% of transactions in the verified user count. You know, like every day we serve customers in 200 countries around the world, you know, and we serve hundreds of institutional clients all over the world too. And that is really sacred. That's like a privilege to serve those customers and to have been trusted, you know, with, you know, we're coming up on a trillion in transactions. Uh, like the dollar value of transactions is approaching a trillion. And so to have that trust from customers to have been, you know, chosen to undertake that for them is like the thing that kind of hits me the most. Um, the financings are cool. And, you know, folks love talking about financings, but they're really just there to help you build uh, the stuff that customers love. And I think that's the thing that, that I really kind of when I look back and reflect and I'm, I'm most proud of and, and kind of uh, hits me the most. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'm actually, I care less about the questions like, what are you going to go do with, I mean, you guys have raised like a billion and a half in the equity and debt markets that look like I was trying to add up this stuff, but I, I think I care less about the, all right, what are you going to go do with a billion dollars? Because I'm sure the question, the answer is just, well, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing, but do it better and do it faster and do it stronger. But I think I'm actually more curious about some of the conversations that were had in the room. Like, uh, how do you pronounce it? Bailey Gifford. And they're like a 110 year old asset management firm, you know, multi billions under management. There were some of the early investors in not any crypto companies, but like Google and Amazon and like these early tech companies. What, what were those kind of conversations like when you first sat down with them? He's been talking to Bailey Gifford for a long time. They're very thesis driven. Um, they, you know, SpaceX, Google, Amazon, great investor. I think for them, what they wanted to see happen was to see there be institutional and retail and crypto. And they were looking for a company that does both. They'd seen a lot of companies that just do one. And they wanted a company with sort of diverse revenue. And, you know, when we got there, you know, about half of our revenue is now institutional. And it was kind of right at that moment that it decided to invest. I heard, uh, I heard an interview that you did, I think it was maybe with Laura Shin in 2019, where you said, I give it two years um, for, for a large country to buy Bitcoin. And here we are, like pretty much two years after that interview, and you've got El Salvador getting into it. Well, not just that, but um, Bulgaria has like a couple billion dollar Bitcoin position that's publicly disclosed. I think, I mean, I think uh, South America, Central America, and Eastern Europe, I used to live in uh, Budapest, Hungary. And that's, that's where I first heard about Bitcoin was in Budapest. And I think the Eastern European countries are just going to get into this uh, in the same way that South American countries are going to get into Bitcoin far faster than any of the developed you know, states or countries in, in like the Western world. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's going to be a lot faster there. I actually think Eastern Europe is probably going to be faster than Latin. We're already seeing that. Um, but uh I definitely think you'll see kind of those countries, you know, like the G40 more broadly, yeah. coming into crypto faster than the G7. Yeah. One more question on the raise, and then I want to get into the business a little bit. You guys raised, I, I used to work in venture, and I couldn't help but noticing that you guys did this like back-to-back -back fundraise, which I hadn't really seen much before. I mean, it happens when in a space that's really hot, but you know, you guys, I don't know, I thought it was really smart of you. You got, you like clearly had some, uh, some good strategy behind the back-to-back -back fundraise rounds and looked like you guys doubled the, the, the valuation in like a month. So I don't know, what, what's the backstory there? Well, we actually did three rounds. Um, one in January and then one in late February and one in early March. And you really just invest our interest. Like we, we've been profitable for quite a while. So 
you know, we weren't raising to, you know, pay for burn or OPEX or CAPEX. Um, but we kept having like really high quality investors want to get involved in the company. And so we just kind of kept saying yes um, at successively higher prices. Um, but it wasn't, you know, I'm not like a master of raising capital. I, I like to build the business and, and, you know, hopefully if you do a good enough job of that, like some capital will come eventually, uh, which is definitely what happened here. We actually spent a lot more time on the debt and you know, we've raised about 2 billion in debt. Um, and it helps to raise equity if you want to raise debt. Uh, but you know, that's been the, the far larger piece of our capital markets operation has been the debt side. What goes, what goes into that decision? Well, when you raise debt, you owe people the money back plus interest. I mean, when you raise equity, you're, you're diluting yourself in the company. Uh, and so debt is sort of de facto, if you think the long-term value of equity is going to be higher than it is today, debt's always a cheaper financing vehicle. Yeah. So why not just raise more and more debt? Well, you need some equity or your balance sheet ends up over leveraged. And sometimes like, look, we wanted to have Bailey Gifford involved in the company. No complaints there. <laughs> Um, so let so I've heard you split the business into a few different sections, um, with different types of customers, different types of products. Um, like I've heard you say developed world versus non-developed, like things like that. But my understanding after kind of digging through the business is there's really four business lines. You've got the data business, uh, the markets business, which is like lending, structured products, things like that. You've got the exchange business and you, you have wallet. So data markets exchange and the wallet business. Is that yeah, right? That's right? Okay. Yeah, you nailed it. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. I was a uh, long shot there, but <laughs> figured I'd take a stab. Which one are you? I mean, they, all, they obviously all kind of work in tandem, right? Like wallet users then trade on the exchange, but which one's growing faster? Which one do you, you know, kind of like more? Which one's driving most of the revenue? Well, revenue is very diverse between the businesses. So the biggest business is our retail business, you know, our wallet business. Um, the fastest growing is the exchange. And the fastest growing by revenue is institutional, the markets business, which is where we do, you know, basically prime brokerage, OTC trading, options, derivatives, uh, and then institutional credit. We run a very large credit book. Uh, you know, that business, it's definitely the fastest revenue revenue growing business we've got. In terms of which one I like the most, I mean, it's hard to get away from the wallet. You know, like it, the opportunity to work on something that touches so many people every day is really special. Yeah, I was speaking with a one of your guys's client, a, a big fund. Um, and I was you know, kind of prepping for this and I said, like, I'm interviewing Peter, what do I need to know? And he, this guy said, look, I think one thing that a lot of people don't know about blockchain.com is they've quickly become one of the largest lending desks. You know, they're up there with folks like Genesis and things like that. What does this business look like? When did you launch this? How, how big is it really? Are we talking top five? It's probably top two. Really? Yeah. Um, you guys in Genesis or? Yeah, it's us in Genesis. Yeah. Wow. And we launched it about two years ago, which is really when sort of institutional credit and crypto became a thing, right? So we were pretty early. And there's a really great team that works on that. Our business is very focused on long term relationships. So, you know, we'll be sort of the number one capital provider to a fund or mining company or you know, Bitcoin ATM company, really anything. But we want to do really deep diligence, have a very long-term loan, very long-term relationship, which makes us different from a lot of the desks out there today, which are kind of doing a lot of like 15 day repo, or it's like a very high rollover. Like we don't have a lot of rollover. We, most of our book is like locked in long-term. I, can you explain? I don't. Can you explain that? Like, what is the role? What is rollover? Closing and reopening loans. Gotcha. You know, so like, the average day is outstanding on a loan for us is probably five x the next desk. Hmm. Like, we're very focused on financing like fundamental infrastructure build. So like, we we do a lot of mining finance. 
whereas like a lot of lending is kind of like very chippy, like long short. So it's like a lot of 15 day repo, like I'm going to buy, you know, borrow this or, you know, mostly for leverage purposes. We do some of those loans, but it's a very small part of our book. Gotcha. So will a miner come to you just for the folks who don't know the lending world that well, like will a miner come to you and say, look, Peter, you know, lending team at blockchain.com, we have, you know, a thousand Bitcoin on our balance sheet. We don't want to sell it. We'll give it to you guys and you give us and you like lend us USD basically so that we can finance a new mining build. Is that the gist behind it? Oftentimes. Yeah. And they, you know, we take custody of their collateral uh, in case they ever miss a margin call. Um, but that is a very popular loan type. Yeah. You're right. Another popular loan type might be for like a crypto credit company, like um, like Bitcoin ATM, where you know someone's depositing dollars, but then they expect to get the crypto immediately. Obviously, like you're not taking the dollars and immediately turning them to crypto because the business needs float, needs inventory, and so we'll loan them inventory. Hmm. You ever had a client miss a? Uh margin call and uh, or get margin call and be pretty damn upset with you guys. <laughs> no, and we, we've never, uh, we've never had a, a major, you know, margin call incident. It's partly because of like, we, we turn down a lot of clients. Hmm. And, you know, when we onboard a client, we're really closely monitoring their mar like their operations. How do they manage their risk? How do they manage their margin calls? What's the time to margin call time to response? And if the stats are not something we're comfortable with, you know, we, we close out the relationship because you have to believe that like on a day where there's a ton of volatility and you're issuing, you know, we've issued a billion in margin calls before. Yeah. You want to know that your clients are going to get those margin calls in. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what's growing faster, the institutional or the retail business? I know you said you're making the revenues growing faster on the institutional, but just in, in terms of. I guess there's different ways to slice it, slice it up. There's user growth, revenue growth. Yeah, absolutely. So Q1, retail grew faster. Q2, institutional grew faster. Hmm. Um, it really goes back and forth. You know, it's kind of like having children. Like, they're all my favorite. I love them all. All right, three, I've, I've heard you describe the uh, kind of blockchain.com customer base. You've broken it into three different segments. So you said there's three types of ways to like slice and dice the data. There's developed world versus non-developed world. There's folks in quote unquote like crisis economies versus non-crisis. And then there's active traders versus non-active traders. I think the when, I think when you described that it was, it was either 2018 or 2019, do you still look at it in the same way? Yeah. I, probably, I think I would add one more slice to that. Instead of just active traders and investors, I would kind of add like, you, like transactors versus hodlers. So there's like, we have like a slice of customers in crypto who are very active, like they log in every day. They do transactions almost every day. They're like, you know, they're like me basically. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing a crypto transaction six out of seven days and then you have people who are active customers they're holding quite a balance but they check like every two or three months you know they maybe make two trades a year they maybe send some crypto to one friend right and these are kind of the hodlers right they're the the long-term you know non-active they're active in crypto in the sense that like just by a virtue of holding crypto you're active in the crypto space you're like putting your vote for the ecosystem, you're gonna stay, in some ways you're like staking the ecosystem, right? Even when you just hold Bitcoin on chain. But they're not like active in the sense that they're like, you know, sending their friend crypto and trying out this new chain and, you know, setting up their BitCloud account and you know, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and so I'd probably add that additional way to cut it. Yeah, uh, I wanna get back to the the segments and stuff, but I saw you guys did a, a little bit, uh, bit clout announcement yesterday. I think, I think bit clout's interesting. Like you've got these big investors, a lot of the big brands in the space are backing it. A lot of the big funds are behind it, but then you jump on Twitter and you know, you know how you have to do the ver I'm verifying my bit clout. 
right? And anyone who does that inevitably just gets torn to shreds for about a 48 hour time period. What's the- Anyone in the, anyone in the crypto community does, yeah. Anyone yeah. outside of the crypto community is totally fine. And I think there's this, there's this toxicity inside the crypto community where things have to be perfect or they're not worth attention. And the reality is that a great social network doesn't need to be crypto perfect at launch. It needs to get more decentralized and more robust over time. And so I think a lot of the criticism of BitCloud is sort of misplaced because you're basically saying like, you guys are not perfect today. It's like, no, neither was Bitcoin when it launched. Like I was around when Bitcoin launched, the fucking thing failed. The, you know, the network had to be forked. Like, and I'll get lots of hate for making that statement, right? But like people had to work together to improve it, to improve the software. It's like saying, look, like there's probably not a single line of code left from the first Bitcoin version that I ran. So things take time. You know, they take time to improve, they take time to get right. And I think what's really cool about BitCloud is that it's the first like decentralized social network to get any kind of traction. Like you look at everything else that has been done in that space, zero traction. Big Cloud and the team there have like, they've got real traction. Like they've got hundreds of thousands of people using it. And that's pretty, pretty cool when you think about where the world is today from a censorship perspective. And that's the biggest thing I care about is increasing human freedom, whether that's economic freedom or freedom of speech. And uh, I don't think Big Cloud's perfect, but I think I've never seen a project that has a better chance to positively impact human freedom through freedom of speech than BitCloud. And so we're super excited to be supporting them. So what do you think about the, I mean, in general, like what do you think about the Bitcoin maxi stuff that happens? I mean, because it's primary, it's not the crypto community trying to take down BitCloud, it's primarily the, this like Bitcoin maxi community who I know like, you know, you, you, you're a hardcore Bitcoiner. Like you've been in the space since what, 2010 or 2011, like as OG as they come. What, what do you think about this Bitcoin Maxi community that's formed on Twitter? I think it's a little sad, honestly. Um, I think if other things were trying to be digital gold, I can understand it. But the Bitcoin community decided like, hey, we're not going to be the one chain to solve everything. I, would think, I think it would have been cool if the community came to a different conclusion, but I was not enough people agreed with me. And that's okay. I'm excited about Bitcoin's more narrow case is digital gold. I think it has a great place in the world, but I don't think that you want to achieve that place in the world by tearing other things down. And so the toxicity and the negativity do make me kind of sad. Hmm. I've kind of noticed when I, while I was prepping for the podcast, you're both prominent in the industry because you got in and so early and you, you've built this massive company <clears throat> that helps millions of people. But there's also somewhat of like a mystery around Peter Smith, I'd say. Is that by design? I don't think it's by design so much as just virtue of like, you know, I went to the Miami Bitcoin conference and it was the first Bitcoin conference I've been to in seven years. I just don't, I don't, you know, I'm not that social. Like I like a podcast, you know, where I'm in my office and you're in your office and it was one-on-one, -on -one. but you know, working a room of 20, 30 people or 12,000 people, is just not what I'm naturally good at or what I naturally feel drawn towards. I love like, being heads down with engineering, you know, still doing some engineering and building and serving customers. And so I just haven't been out that much. And then we just don't do that much PR, right? Like we're not a PR machine by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, nowadays we don't, we don't really even do press releases. We just put up blog posts. You know, press like, where's the press release? We're like, oh, www blog.blockchain.com. <laughs> so we're just not that, right? And I, so I think the mystery is not really mystery. It's just, I'm not around that much. Yeah. It's absence. It's not mystery. It's absence. Yeah. You ever get FOMO when you see like other big brands like, you know, FTX, like, you know, sponsoring every single party in Miami and 
you know, these big press releases and the interviews on Bloomberg and things like that? You know, I've, uh, I've done my share of TV. Yeah, I was, and more and more lately. But I think if you're that disappointed about that and not excited about serving customers, like there's probably like some kind of insecurity or ego that you're trying to address. Like if I thought that by going on TV every day, I could get 10 million more consumers into crypto in the next year, I would do it. But I don't think that's how it would happen. Like the people that watch CNBC and Bloomberg, they know crypto exists for like the last five years. Like it's not a surprise, right? To get 10 million more people into crypto, like I need to figure out how to make it easier and more useful. And that's not done on TV. That's done with the whiteboard. You know, and it's done with math and it's done with the hard miles. And so that's kind of where I want to spend my time. I mean, kind of a microcosm is Miami, right? We didn't sponsor any parties. We did sponsor the conference. We are like one of the title sponsors. And we built a really beautiful coffee lounge cafe, like brought in really great baristas and put up really beautiful space to provide like space to our clients um, and portfolio companies, because we have a, a large venture fund, to have meetings, like quiet, intentional, productive meetings. And that's kind of blockchain in a nutshell. Like you won't see us buying tables at a nightclub. You know, you won't see us sponsoring a music festival. You'll see us like building a cafe designed to host people while they have serious conversations about building the future of the industry. Yeah. And you know, and we won't put it on a billboard. Like we'll just be there quietly in the background, building away, helping other people build away. Because at the end of the day, that's what we care about. All right, guys, it's ad time. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. There's one company that's powering a ton of the crypto data in the space. And by crypto data, basically there's all these uh, companies, traditional financial institutions that need crypto data for you know accounting purposes, for tracking the value of their assets, for running audits, right? And so there's one company, they're called Luca. L-U-K-K-A, I've talked about them on the podcast before. They're powering some of the largest businesses in the world in both the crypto and traditional financial services space. They're the primary pricing source used by S&P Dow Jones indices for their new crypto index. So I want to uh, just throw this out there. If you guys are any sort of business that needs to value crypto assets, create financial statements, uh, perform any sort of normal accounting audit process, you guys should head on over. It's Luca, L-U-K-K-A, Luca.tech, L-U-K-K-A dot T-E-C-H forward slash empire, or just head over to Luca.tech forward slash empire. Tell them I sent you, they'll take care of you. Alrighty, let me know what you think. The other day I posted on Twitter, I said, who's the best entrepreneur? Who's the entrepreneur that everyone should know in crypto, but maybe doesn't know already, right? We're not talking like the mainstream, the super big folks. Who's the best entrepreneur that's kind of under the radar in crypto? God, post went crazy. Got like 300, 400 comments. There was one name that kept popping up, JP Richardson. JP Richardson at Exodus. So I thought, man, that's crazy. Exodus is one of our sponsors. Let me call him out, right? So JP Richardson, CEO of Exodus, done an amazing job building one of crypto's most loved apps. And there's a number of reasons. They got a mobile app, they got a desktop app. You can instantly exchange over a hundred different currencies. They've got interactive charts. Uh, they're fully integrated with uh, the Trezor hardware wallet, so you can always be secure. So if you're looking to buy crypto, if you're looking to just get away from just buying one or two currencies, you wanna explore other things, go to exodus.com forward slash empire, or just search Exodus in the uh, App Store or Play Store. Check them out, shoot me a DM on Twitter, let me know what you thought. Go follow JP Richardson, go check out Exodus. All right, exodus.com forward slash empire. You guys have a really interesting wallet business. Is, is it the biggest wallet business in all of crypto? I mean, massive wallet business anyways. Yeah, it's either, it's either the first it's either the first or the second, depending yeah. on how you count. I'm, I'm trying to think of basically what a wallet, what a crypto wallet looks like in like 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. I think my thoughts are pretty similar to you, which is basically like your, your crypto wallet is just a web browser for this new financial system. And 
I'm trying to figure out like what that unlocks in the same way that we had the internet, but you know, the iPhone was kind of this moment that unlocked things like Uber and Snapchat um, and Lyft and things like that. So I don't know, I'd love to hear your thoughts because I'm, I'm sure you've thought about this 10 times more than I have. Like what, what is the future of digital wallets? You're basically like almost building a car to drive around the crypto world, which is maybe not the best analogy, but like you can store things in a car, a car, a car needs fuel. It's like a complicated machine that they've somehow made easy to drive. But like a wallet will be like a car. It's like how you navigate the crypto world. And I think that the challenge in every wallet product is balancing the new customers with the core active customers because the needs are very different. We have 100,000 people that show up on our site and just want to buy their first Bitcoin or ETH. How do you balance that with someone that's been in crypto for six years? It's challenging. So like to get a little more granular, is there in the same way that the iPhone unlocked Uber and Lyft and you know Snapchat and Instagram, like have we seen our iPhone moment yet? Are we going to have our iPhone moment? No. <laughs> I think it's a ways out it took the iPhone like 10 years to kind of be actually useful. Yeah. Like be really magical. And probably got another three or four years before crypto wallets are like, yeah, I, uh, I've saved all my old iPhones. I remember I got one of the first iPhones and, uh, the thing is like so slow and so ancient. But back then I remember showing all, all my friends. I'm like, Oh my God, look at this. Look at this thing. It's like my portal to the internet. And now you couldn't even imagine using one of those. Um, so it just reminds you how quickly things can change. I mean, when I look at what our wallet does today versus what our wallet did four or five years ago, it's it's like, whoa. Yeah. Like, what was this thing? Yeah. When I think about what it'll do in five more years, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Yeah. All right, let's talk DeFi. I think the, the more like a journalistic question would be, you know, you know, you read, you read the Coinbase S1, they said there's a lot of risk factors, you know, do you see DeFi as a risk to blockchain.com? I think you would probably say no, and you'd say you're excited by DeFi. I think what I'm really curious about is like, okay, you don't go to the big parties on Saturday night. I'm assuming you're playing around with DeFi like the rest of us, like nerding out on some of these, on some of these things. Like, what are your views on, on DeFi? Like, what are you playing with these days? Oh, man. So first of all, I actually think... We're, we're sort of the original DeFi company in the sense that like DeFi is about on-chain transactions and people having their own private key. And like, we are, we are those dudes. We are those dudes that insist on everyone having their own private key, right? And we will custody your crypto for you with, with joy. We'll do it with a smile on our face while annoying you ceaselessly about using your own private key. It's, it's a huge opportunity for us. We have 33 million real people around the world that have their own private keys that can interact with any DeFi protocol or product. And so one of the things that we're constantly doing is being like, hey, what's ready for prime time from the DeFi space? And the reality is very little is. Very little has the scale or the product polish or the security and safety that we could like plug it in to 32 million people. That said, won't be too long before it does. And that'll be really fucking cool. Yeah. Now, in terms of me, I think I'm like farming, you know, or trading over the last week on like six different protocols. What's the, what's the like, if someone's listening to this podcast and they're like, what the hell are these guys talking about? Like, what is DeFi farming? What is yield farming? What's the, what's like the first 30 minutes? Like, where do you send someone? So the coin gecko guy who I don't know at all, by the Bobby? way, Bobby, Great guy. Bobby on, yeah. don't know him, never met him. Just to be clear, wrote a great book <laughs> that you can download on the internet. And the first thing that I would do is tell them to go download that book and read it, you know, before they like, that way they have a general sense of what's going on, right? Um, or maybe I'd send them the uh, Mark Cuban blog post that came out the other day, which is I think is a higher level kind of version of that. And everything in this space gets outdated quickly, but like the basic principles, I think Bobby did a really good job with. Um, 
probably tell them that. But I would send them to read that book first. Nice. And then I would probably tell them like that a good entry point is like, you know, one of the vaults, like adamant or yearn. Yeah. Crazy world, crazy space. I mean, you, I, I, like a more in-depth question on DeFi. I mean, you have a pretty, you're pretty, you have a pretty uh, nuanced view of like uh, traditional capital markets. And it was, I listened to your old podcast. Like you, you understand how financial markets work pretty well, um, more than, you know, better than most people, I'd say. What do you think DeFi unlocks that doesn't exist today? Well, it's really what crypto unlocks, which is really like a, a resilient financial system. It unlocks the ability to take risk and manage risk and pool liquidity without being reliant on a third party. And the reliance on third parties is expensive and risky. We see that in the financial system all the time. You don't have that in crypto. Like you don't have the contagion that spreads to the rest of it in DeFi because it's all on chain. Like there is no third party, there is no custodian. And I think that that's really interesting from a velocity of capital perspective. Um, it also just makes things easier. Like, you know, launching a new asset now, I mean, even a couple of years in crypto was like, I had to go like beg the exchanges, right? Now you just go on over to sushi swap. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Like the, dis the disintermediation is really big. Yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot to ask that I wanted to ask you before, and then we'll start to wrap this up, um, is there are these cycles that have played out. I mean, I haven't been in for nearly as long as you, but like when you guys raised capital in 2014, there were five financings and they're all, all wallet companies. There's Coinbase, Zappo, I'm not gonna, oh, Circle, you guys. And then I think you could categorize BitGo as a, as a wallet back then, um, like this multi-sig thing. Uh, you know, now it's all about exchanges, right? So like there's these cycles, there's both the bull and the bear cycles where, you know, price goes up, price goes down, price goes up, price goes down. But, but I'm curious about like the what's hot and what's not. It goes like wallets, exchanges, custody, wallets, exchanges, lenders, right? What's hot right now in your mind and what is not that hot that you think will maybe take off in the next 12 to 18 months? Well, you, you're also forgetting about chip makers, mining companies, um, DLT companies. Yeah. Like, there's been a lot yeah, of yeah. payment processors. That was a hot thing. For yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's always something, right? I think exchanges are probably overbought right now. I'd say that as a dude that runs an exchange, as one part of our business. I think exchanges are probably overbought. I think. Protocols are overbought. Frankly, there's too many. I think what's underbought right now is probably consumer UX. Like it's actually pretty hard to do most things in crypto besides buy your first Bitcoin and even that can be hard, right? Like most of the things people try to do in crypto, like, you know, we take them for granted, but you know, when you're going out there to your farm, you're like, all right, I'll get my last pass, my ledger, copy this from EtherScan. Oh no, now I gotta flip to Polygon Scan. Now I gotta flip to like APY Vision, back to Xerion. Like you got like 10 tabs open, you know. Then you got your weird spreadsheet. Nothing matches, nothing adds up. You're like, all right, let's do this. Let's go. That's pretty weird. Yeah. That's pretty weird. If you can yield farm with only 10 tabs open, I, uh, I tip my hat. <laughs> yeah. 10, 10 tabs is like a light estimate. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like for one strategy, 10 tabs. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, uh, that's weird. Yeah. You know, whereas like, where you're like, you tell, you know, you, some, somebody launches something on Binance and your friend's interested and they're like, right, I want to go buy the same. I'm like, well, first you got to create an account over here, buy some of this, turn into this stable coin. ERC-20 stablecoin, not, I, I know there's like seven tethers, but like use the ERC-21. Like all this stuff is very weird. You know, like why can't you send dollars from blockchain to Binance choosing which underlying rail? Yeah. You know, and, and then waiting and then it getting lost in a bridge and, you know, I, I don't know. It's like, it's just very difficult. And 
even buying your first Bitcoin, I don't know how many people you've watched buy their first Bitcoin lately. So kind of a daunting experience. Very daunting. Very. Um, and then you got folks in, uh, I live in New York. You've got New York folks. Like half the apps can't even work in New York, so. Yeah, well, the People's Republic of New York is tough. Very tough. I know, you pull up an app, it's like, this doesn't work in North Korea, Cuba, and New York City. So, good luck. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right, start to wrap this up. Um, where are we at in the market cycle right now? Somewhere. Spoken like someone who's been in this for far too long. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... Uh, I don't think we're in a bear market. But that's a really... I mean, somewhere is like my honest answer. I'm not being glib. Uh, my, 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 my market view right now is we're somewhere. Where do you think we are, Jason? Um... I think I, I mean the way that the everyone listening wants you you to answer is basically related to price, right? I think there's a lot of ways to answer that, not related to price, but I mean related to price. I think we're a long way, a long way. We've got a long way to go. I mean, there's just too many people and too much pro, too many good products that I know of that you know of as well that are being built that just haven't. Yeah, I don't, there's just too there's too much being built right now, and too many people looking at this industry not to say that we have a long way to go. So we'll see, we'll see. I could be dead wrong, but that's crypto. Um, all right, last two questions here, Peter. Uh, and then you can flip it and ask me one if you'd, uh, if you, if you'd like. Um, I read a, a, one of your Medium posts is an email to your team that you sent about kind of some core values that you wanted to work on in 2021. One was surfing openly, one was embracing the stoke, and one was moving to a long-term focus, both in work and personal life, uh, to just make sure that you can be a sustainable leader of blockchain.com and not get burnt out, it looked like. How, how would you say those are going? It's like a good time for a mid-year reflection, so thank you. Um, but I think some are going better than others. I think probably like long-term sustainability, not so great. It's been really busy lately, been, been working a lot. Um, I think this cycle more than any other mar market cycle, I've been able to stay focused on the long term rather than on the block and tackle day to day, which has been really good, really good for me and, and hopefully good for the company if I'm making good long term choices. Um, and then serving openly, I think is probably the thing that I've made the most progress on. And, you know, that is just this idea of like, it's pretty natural to struggle. And when I struggle openly, it kind of creates an environment where other people can struggle openly. And I think that that is something that's really important to me because I don't want people to struggle alone. And the first step to not struggling alone is for people to know when you're struggling. And, and so, you know, my hope is that by talking openly about stress, burnout, not not knowing, you know, of being overwhelmed, so on and so forth, is that it creates an environment where other people can feel that as well and talk about it openly. And we can come together as a team to to be more than the sum of our parts. Um, but I think, you know, the reality is, like, I've been a CEO now for a really long time. Um, I think, you know, I'm not sure how what the average tenure of a venture-backed CEO is, but I've, I've got to be over it at this point. And it takes a time to learn how to do this job. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, still make a lot of mistakes. The question is like, how do you keep growing as a leader? And that's something that I'm really interested in. Um, and I think our team like deserves to have the best CEO possible. And given that they're kind of stuck with me, means that I have to grow as a CEO and as a leader on a, on a continual basis. Yeah. Are you starting to think, I mean, I know you guys have hired a bunch of executives. Are you starting to think about going public pretty soon? The company has, the company currently has the ability to go public. <laughs> <laughs> and the board and I are evaluating all of our options. <laughs> Your general counsel loves you right now. <laughs> nice. Shout out, Lindsay. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, no, I'm excited to see. I'm excited what you guys do. I have a feeling you guys will do it in a 
funky and unique and creative way, as, as creative as you can do. So we've got some ideas. Nice. Nice. All right, well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, all right. Last question. Then you can flip on sushi swap. We're going to go public on sushi swap. There you go. All right. <laughs> bold, bold take. Um, no. Your your GC is like, why'd you have to do that? Why? You were doing so well. She's like, you were crushing it. Um, what's the biggest thing keeping you up at night right now? That's You talked about stress. Like, what are you stressed about right now? Well, the biggest thing keeping me up right now is allergies. It's hay fever season here. And I'm struggling with that. Um, I worry about a lot of the infrastructure in our market. You know, like the downtime that you see across exchanges still is really worrying. You know, large lending platforms making simple accounting mistakes. Yeah, that's what I worry about. The, the fragility of a lot of the companies and their yeah. technology. Yeah. All right. We can wrap this up. You want to flip it, flip it and ask me one question? When you were conducting your research, which you were very well prepared for this, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about the company? I think I didn't realize all that you guys do. It's kind of a high level answer, but I, you know, I've been in the industry not as long as you, but since 2015 and really in, really in it since in 2016, 2017. And I, I, I feel like I have a decent sense of what most of the brands and companies do. Um, but like, I didn't realize you have this, I, I knew you had a lending desk. I didn't realize it was, top five, maybe top two. I knew you had an exchange. I remember when it was launched called The Pit, um, which I learned through the podcast that that, 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 that was a bad idea uh, to call it The Pit. But I didn't realize it was one of the, the biggest exchanges with the, with the deepest liquidity, right? I knew you had a wallet business, but I didn't realize it was like number one or number two. I knew you had a data business. I didn't realize how much data you guys have been collecting for a decade. So I think it was just the breadth of the business um, it feels like every company is kind of converging right now. Uh, everyone's building a crypto bank. It feels like everyone's got an exchange, everyone's lending, everyone's trading, everyone gives you interest. Everyone, everyone, it feels like everyone's building the same thing, but I didn't realize how deep into these products you guys are. Yeah. We're like a, we're like a submarine just slightly below the waves. Yeah. I like it. Awesome, man. Well, this has been a great interview. Um, you guys have a nice domain, which is easy for me to end this with. People can go over to blockchain.com, open up a wallet with you guys, trade. Um, I think, do you guys do staking as well now? Staking, so all that fun stuff. Um, and then I know you respond to emails, I think, and uh, you're on Twitter, so people can find yeah. out all over the place. Yeah, I'm just one more Peter on Twitter. DM's open. Love to be in touch. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me on the show, Jason. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming on. All right, Peter. Cheers. Cheers.